Welcome to another episode of the Dan Lok Show. Today, I am so excited. We're going to talk about closing. We're going to talk about high ticket, right? I have joining me a very successful entrepreneur, a coach, uh, a trainer to so many people from all around the world. And her programs have helped, has helped thousands and thousands of entrepreneurs worldwide. Shonda, welcome to the show. Hi, Dan. I'm super excited to play with you right now. I am so excited. I'm so excited. I have so many questions. I know we're going to, we can go so many different directions, right? But I always want to take us back to the beginning, right? We know where you are today, but take us back where where you started, where, where you came from and how did you even get into what you do today? Well, Dan, I'll never forget the day I was sitting on my floor and I was so broke it hurt. And I remember having the realization that if I was allowed to work, because I'm Canadian from Vancouver, Canada, yes, and I was in America, and I was thinking, you know, if if I was allowed to work, like, it's such a privilege to be able to work. Like, I got that in that moment. Like, it's such a privilege to be able to work. If I was allowed to work in America, I could do anything I want. So Mm -hmm. when I look at my back journey all the way up, I actually never thought I was going to necessarily be an entrepreneur. I just knew that I was made for more. I just knew that... There's like a knowing inside you when you know that you're supposed to be, I mean, as weird as the word is, rich. Like I knew that I was supposed to be wealthy. I knew I was made for more. But where my life was sitting was sitting on an empty apartment floor in Las Vegas, so broke that it hurt. And um, when I had that realization that I was not only made for more, but my bank account was not representing where I wanted to go, I started seeking Um, anything I could do to figure out how to get really good at sales, get really good at talking to people, landing with people. Uh, I ended up running nightclubs in Las Vegas when I finally got my, my citizenship in America because my dad's American. My mom's Canadian. I was born in Canada. Long story short to collapse all that time. I eventually got my passport to be in America. So once that happened, I just, my work ethic went through the roof and I ran nightclubs in Vegas had a moment running a nightclub that I realized. Can you share with us like maybe one funny story from running the nightclub? I'm sure you know, have, you have so many stories. Yeah, I mean, I've danced with Sandra Bullock on the, on the dance floor. Wow. Uh, I've had uh, like, uh, yeah, there's a lot of crazy moments. A lot, and, and also not just that, it's like I shared this from stage for the first time last year and didn't realize it was a part of my story I was leaving out. Like I woke up one day and I was, you know, part of running a nightclub is drinking a lot of champagne which right. eventually led to uh, doing drugs, doing cocaine to mm-hmm. stay up. Mm-hmm. And I, it's a part of my life I actually hid for quite some time because I'm Shanda now. And I just like almost ignored it. And it was so, so impactful that people keep asking me to share it because it's hard to believe that I was there. But I woke up one day and I looked at my legs and they were so skinny that mm-hmm. I realized that it looked like they were going to break. And I was like, holy cow, like I'm putting myself in the grave right now. Mm-hmm. And I grabbed peanut butter and I started like eating peanut butter to like put weight back on because I scared the heck out of myself and I stopped doing any drugs or alcohol at that point, like cold Turkey. Mm -hmm. But I kept finding myself in jobs that I was rising to the top and I was becoming general managers, VPs, and you know, VP of sales, VP of investor relations. And, but I never felt fulfilled. Hmm. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, I think money's amazing. I don't think anybody should ever live without it. I mean, I hate the saying like, you know, money doesn't, you know, money doesn't grow on trees and money doesn't like create happiness. And I'm like, well, actually it does when you understand sales and marketing, it does kind of grow on trees. It's, it's about the equivalent. It, it really is just a formula, but it does also bring happiness because when you can afford to fly first class or private or, you know, be able to afford good medical, mm. you know, be able to afford putting your children in Montessori school. I mean, when money does provide moments of happiness. Correct. And you don't want to live without it. But the chase that I had to make money, I thought would create some level of importance or give me some sort of feedback that, you know, I'm good or I'd be happy. And that's not quite it. Like I had to find the thing I'm doing today Mm -hmm. to be able to find that trajectory that I was willing to put all the gears on. Do you know what I mean? Like where you can't, like, it's like, you know, you matter so much that it's like, you can't stop. I could, I could relate so much to the story because from my 20s to 30s, I was chasing success and money. And I thought once I make, as you know how it is, once I make a certain amount of money, then I will feel good. Then I will feel important. Yeah. And the funny thing is when I hit goal after goals after goal, as you know, as type A personality, you achieve a goal. The minute you achieve a goal, it's like, okay, what's next, right? You're like, that's it. 
what's yep. next? Say some next thing, and you thought maybe buying that next car or that next house. Then everything, you know, then I would feel good about myself. And exactly like your your journey, when I shift from chasing success to you, to focus on more on significance, right? More yeah. On helping others, then everything shifts. Then the funny thing is, you get the money. And you get the purpose, you yeah. get the fulfillment, you get it all, right? So I could, I could relate so much. Yeah. Um, talk to us a little bit about the art of receiving money. Because I think a lot of people where they want to make more money, but somehow they have this wall, right? They have this maybe negative association with money or people with money that they want money, but at the same time, they're not very good at receiving it. Talk to us about that. Yeah, so I would say if you've ever said that you hate to be sold, um, or that you hate it. <laughs> yes. Pop ups online. Yes. And I'm like, get over it. You know yeah. what I mean? Like when you're when you're in when you're suffering around something, mm. it is a relief that uh, somebody, an entrepreneur, most likely, has created some sort of a product or a service, and it ends up in your inbox or ends up in a pop up somewhere. And it's like when when you when you really are able to uh, be sold. I think that you're able to receive more money because what it takes in your leadership to stand up. I'll tell I was leading an event the other day and first time in a really long time. I led three events in, in nine days and you know, it's like seven figure weeks, you know what I mean? And, and it's crazy because it used to take me, it used to take me three years to make seven figures when I was trying to figure it out. Now it's like, you can do it in a couple of days. You can do it one day. You can do it in a week. I mean, it's really what you, what you choose. And I don't want to sound materialistic because I'm not, I'm very heart driven. Mm. And I give a ton of money away. Mm. But I will tell you that like when I was leading this event the other day, it was kind of like I was having this moment. Where I was like, I feel like I made the offer. People said yes. And I was going to do a repitch. Mm. And then there was something caught, got caught in my head where I felt like, oh, like I felt a little gross about mm. doing a repitch. And okay. I had to shift my mind so quick because I was like, I was like, first of all, my team, so I search immediately for what is the thing to enroll myself out of this limited, not even limiting, selfish thought. Mm. Like, I don't want to do a repitch because I don't want, I, I feel gross. I feel like I just made an offer. It was just a two day event. It just felt too close together. Mm. You know, I talked to a couple of people that were struggling to get across the line. I was like, Ugh. and so I almost didn't do the repitch. My team's looking at me like, is she going to do the repitch? Is she going to do the repitch? Mm. And I looked at them. I'm like, first of all, as a leader, you have to do what you say you're going to do. So I was like, I'm looking at my team going, they're going to lose confidence in me if I don't do the repitch. Yeah. Secondly, how can I ever teach like entrepreneurs how to go out there and really put themselves out there and play full out no matter what other people think about them if I'm getting caught in this? And that was enough to get me over the hook mm. and make the repitch. And we did really well and walked a lot of people across the line because of doing the repitch. I share this with you because people need you to be great. Mm. They don't need you to be good. They need you to be great because okay. all of us, when we're climbing to the next level, the next level we've never been before. And even if we look super confident, there are moments, there are moments where we're like, I don't know if I could do, I don't know if I can become a New York times bestseller. It's true. That's true. You know, and it's, it's a little freaky. Mm, it's true. It's true. It's not like we don't have doubts. We have doubts too. It's what we do, how we deal with that doubt. I couldn't agree with you more because I think most people, I always, I always teach my students, those who are afraid to buy are always afraid to sell. Yes. If you have any negative association towards, oh, I don't know if I want to do the repitch. I don't know if I want to make the offer or I don't want to come across maybe too salesy or things like that. And the funny thing is I always look at those emotions where, if I feel this way, like you said, if you feel gross, who are we focusing on? We're focusing on ourselves, yeah. how we feel our ego, right? What, we, what we're saying is, well, I don't want to come across as we're, we're too pushing or, or I don't want to come across. I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm like, uh, well, you're trying to be friends. Yeah, yes, exactly. Friends, and your role in that moment is not to be a friend. Your role in that moment is to help people overcome whatever wall they're facing 100%. so that they can say yes to something they want. 100%. So don't confuse the roles. You know what I mean? Like know who your friends are, know what hat you're wearing in a moment. And I always say like, Dan, entrepreneurship, like it, it's, I mean, it's not about you. It has nothing to do with you. Yes. Like the more generous you can become yes. is when things start to work. But it's like, I'll watch somebody like do a program, product or service, get results. And then be like, 
hey, why don't you come back and teach some of this to the students? They're like, ah, oh, I don't have time. I'm like, I got to go over. And I'm like, you're not getting it. No. Like the more you can come back and serve, the more you can like give and be generous, the more you stop making decisions from the place of like, I can't do it because I'm focusing on something that's important to me. The more that you can unhook from that thought, yes. you will skyrocket. It's very, very true. And, and I think entrepreneurs, you can see the struggling entrepreneurs, it's always focusing on, I call them sometimes lifestyle entrepreneur, right? Oh, what, what do I want, right? And what, what kind of lifestyle I want? And, and the ones who are always thriving and, and prospering, what do my customers want, right? What, what do my clients want? How can I add more value? How can I do it better? How can I build a bigger, bigger team, better team so I can serve them more? The funny thing is, is, you know, when you focus on others, money just comes. Yeah, and people think we're lying about that. They don't get they, it. They yet. somehow don't trust that. Yeah. And the only reason why people don't buy or you don't buy anybody, yeah. that, like it's like, it, the only reason why people don't buy is they either don't trust the product or service Mm. but they don't believe it's going to work for them. Yes. It just always comes mm. down to those two things. And yeah. so nine times out of 10 people have let themselves down so many times and not kept their word to whatever they said they were committed to that mm. they are simultaneously putting their business and their life in the grave. Mm. I'm curious now when you, when you coach entrepreneurs, they say someone comes to you and, and, and they need help. Uh, what are the, the first few things you teach them to focus on to take the business to the next level? So I believe if you, this is just what I've found to be true. Um, I think there's many ways of doing it, but what's true for me, uh, humbly, is comes, comes down to the fact that I feel like if you control the buyer, you control everything. So mm -hmm. most people want to create the product or service first. Mm. Kind of like what you said about asking your customers what they want. Yes. I believe you should create the audience first. And if you create the audience first and you mm. ask the audience what they want around something that you have mastered, Mm. Then you, or unless you're delivering, you can be a serial entrepreneur and you've got other products that you're delivering. You still want to ask yep. the audience, what is it that they want around this product? Mm. And then match their words with the marketing, meaning that whatever they specifically say, use all of that in the marketing. Again, at one of our events last week, I asked the audience, what, what has been your takeaway from the selling retreat? I taught a selling retreat. I haven't taught one in four years. And mm. so I taught one and they gave me all the words. And then I said to them, do you realize that you just created the sales page, all the marketing emails, everything. We're just gonna use your exact words. Yes. And we're going to put it out there and sell this product. Yes, that's awesome. It's like I always say, we are not the marketing genius, the customer is always the marketing genius, yeah. right? It, it, I know it sounds so simple, ask what they want and, and then give it to them, right? It is, <laughs> it, it, it actually, you know this, it actually is that simple, but people don't survey or they do bad surveys. They don't ask enough, they're talking too much. And, and they're, they're creating products and services because they're inspired. They're like, yeah. oh, and they're inspired. And I'm like, oh my God, like, I don't want you to be, in, I want you to be inspired and lit up about whatever a group of people are saying that they need. And you should be inspired that your life can be of service to that group of people and create the product all around that. Don't put anything else in and give them what they want. Mm. And then when it, when it comes to, let's say, building that, that audience, right? controlling the buyers. Uh, what do you suggest someone goes out to do? Like what's been most effective for you or also for your students? Yeah. So I was actually just talking to Frank Kern about this, like last month. We're out for, I don't know if you know, but we're out for, we're out, we're out for lunch. And, and I said, he goes, I think email marketing is dead. And I said, Frank, why do you send so many emails in? And I go, I'm like, I just like Russell Brunson's last event. Every funnel was delivered through emails. Like maybe there's traffic on the, but they're de like delivered. Um, I don't know. I bought a $40,000 like package that I don't follow this person on social media, but I saw her email come in and I'm not even in email. I run my whole business through Slack, right? But I'm in my email to shop or whatever. I buy a $40,000 copy package with someone that I don't follow on, on social. So I do believe that you need all the pieces. Like I, but I think when I look at entrepreneurs, we help a lot of people segue out of corporate or who have been, you know, they've been, they haven't really hit, they, they don't control their traffic. And I say, I say, first control your real estate in your email. First control your real estate. Cause even when I go market online, like Facebook, YouTube, anything, I'm uploading my list and creating look like audiences from my list. So, and then we upload just our buyers as well so that we can super target those people. So I like that I own the real estate on social, which I'm very active on, on social, um, I don't own the audience. And it's a shared, it's a shared crop. 
Mm. And so, you know, when I look at that, I'm like, it, first I'm saying, you know, control the, control the audience in an email list and then learn how to market to them because that's your cheapest way right. to market. Right. Once you figure that out, once you figure out what your initial offer is, how to sell it and that it actually works, mm. then go and buy a ton of traffic as much as you can and just knock it out of the park and scale. You know, mm. I believe that you sell one thing really well first. Mm. Um, I'm determined to grow a billion dollar company and not kill myself. Like I, we're, you know, we're an eight figure company and we'll four X this year. And I took off five and a half months last year. I figured this out in the last two weeks. We've had four couples ask us about our relationship, my husband and myself, you know, how are you guys managing this stuff? And it's legitimate. It's not a facade. Like talk to any of our friends on the back end. You'll see, we really live this way. I don't think balance is real, but I do think the way you strategize your business makes a big difference. I sell one product very well, and then I cross sell products that they need. Mm. Can you maybe walk us through your model? Like what's the, the first, like your signature product and then like what's the ascension? Yeah. Like how does that work? So first we, for, we do have an info product. Mm. We don't push it very, very much, even mm. though I think it's great. We're probably missing the mark on some of that. I mm. get Sometimes you let things bleed as you scale mm -hmm. up. Mm -hmm. and so, and then you pick it back up and add it into the strategy. But mm -hmm. we typically sell a, a year long, um, a year long program called Pace Private. And okay. we teach how to build email lists that are super targeted, right? Mm -hmm. They're all referral based email list. Okay. And, and then we teach them how to sell to that. So it has a high ROI. I'm about to do the same type of build. I'll probably have about a hundred thousand opt-ins in the series of about 10 days and it's mm. all referral base. Got so it. I like that because it's hot. It's, mm. it's kind of hard to screw up hot, hot traffic. Mm. <laughs> you know, even if you're bad at your marketing, it's yeah. still hot traffic. So yeah. it gets the entrepreneurs cash flowing. So okay. bring them through that program. We teach them how to sell to that email list, teach them how to build it and then create products and, and sell. So creating them. an audience first, right? That's the, yeah. your, your, your signature program. Exactly. Um, the, under so that's what we do in that program but but what we're committed to is we're committed to teaching them how to be generous entrepreneurs which mm. creates a culture inside of our company where all the entrepreneurs are hiring each other and they're 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 not just a community they i mean to give you an idea mm. in 10 in 10 weeks they referred 700 people that 700 showed up of the 900 people that they invited to my last event Mm. You know, like we are a community that shows up like that. Yeah. So I, I'm actually teaching them leadership in that program, mm. like hidden underneath, you know, the monetization plan, the email mm. list and the seller. I love it. I love it. And, yeah. and that's, so once they go through that year, they choose in or out about 70% of those people, we add anywhere between 40 and 70, sometimes a hundred people a month to that program. Mm. Once, once they go through that program, 70% uh, of them come to a, a mastermind that they do between the ninth and 12th month that they like towards the ninth or 12th month of ending that program. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So, it. yeah. so it's, it's like their year end mastermind, but we time it so that it's between nine and 12 months. Cause Got it. So they've already gone through materials. They're implementing and getting results. That's right. Right? that's right. That's right. In that mastermind, we teach them, but then we, we teach them 12 month ascension plans and all this stuff. But what we, what we do is in those two days, we make them an offer. And the way, the way I make the offer is I'll pitch them in pace. I pitch, pitch, pitch to get them in pace club. Mm. So when they go through pace, they're through that year, they get to the end, they go their mastermind at mm. that mastermind. I'm not pitching them anymore because I, I want them off the, I want them off the bottle. Mm. I want like, you know, I want them to be thinking for themselves. Mm. Did you gain value here? Do you want to be with us? And do you want to spend the next four to five years with me so that I can really help you build a significant company versus coach hop, you mm. know? Mm. And so 70% come to that 60% of those people say yes mm. to another year program. And they stay with us for three to five years at that point. Mm, makes so, sense. And, and, and if you don't mind me asking, what's the, the, the pace? Uh, what's the price point on that? And then the, 15,000. 15,000. Okay. So 15,000. We yeah. used to upsell to the next program. Now we downsell to 12,000. Okay. We're building more of an entrepreneur organization now. Mm. And I'm actually preparing for the recession coming. Oh, that's interesting. Talk to us about that. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, it's a brick wall that we're heading towards and yeah. I want to explode in it. And um, I want to help our entrepreneurs explode in it. And I think it's a really good opportunity for a, a huge leap in wealth and impact 
in one shot and we're going to wait some time to get there. So um, you probably already know this where we are going to be at a 30% skill deficit in the yeah. job market. Yeah. And we'll be at a 50% skill deficit next year. Nobody knows really how to handle this. So yeah. anybody who says they do, they don't. Like nobody yeah. knows. None of the big companies know. Nobody knows. And I was just in Dubai and reading, you know, the financials and the magazines for business in Dubai. I And literally the same thing. It's a global thing. So the way to look at that is there is a global opportunity, <laughs> which is huge, right? Like usually it's one country. It's a global opportunity. It's a global issue. Yes, and I believe that creativity and leadership is the key that's going to really help people innovate. Mm. I think that entrepreneurism is going to change <laughs> because I think um, people who are not entrepreneurs now and are in corporate jobs are going to become entrepreneurs. Mm. So I am now targeting corporate a lot mm. and uh, doing leadership trainings in corporate, not myself, but our trainers, and you know, really just creating the relationships with the human beings there because they're going to be they're going to, I mean, it's already happening. It's already, <laughs> it's already happening. happening. I have more corporate people coming into our company than ever right. before because they've worked for a company for 12 years. They're making half a million dollars a year and they've been axed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I can see it's now from before, uh, it's more the economy, the job economy, right? Where you have a job, you work for a big company, not only they gain downsize, uh, but I could see now There's shifting. No jobs. Yeah, it, no, it's technology. There's no it's jobs. Technology. It's, it, it, it's exactly, and it's it's also now. That's why I teach all my students is focusing on their high income skills, right? It's a skill economy, right? Once yeah. you have the skill, it's it's more a freelance economy, like right, to, to better better describe. Yeah, it. yeah. Well, think about this though. Like uh, at the hotel last week, one of our events, one of our students um, called for room service to get toothbrushes. And they took a video because a robot showed up. Oh, wow. A robot. Now, right now. Right their now. Night staff, their night staff are robots at a major chain hotel. And so this, they took a whole video, this robot, and then the robot leaves and goes back in the elevator and like as if it's normal. And that is going to be what's normal. <laughs> people are getting, I mean, look at events. Instead of people lining up just at the coffee shop, there's now lattes and all that in machines. You go to McDonald's in Dubai at the airport, there's only a couple people working there because everybody's ordering off the machines. And so where are these people going? Mm. There's, no, there's nowhere for them to go this time. Mm. No, there's nowhere for them to go. So now more than ever, um, you know, if we kind of have laughed at like, oh, entrepreneurship is trendy. We need to stop saying that. And we need to empower human beings. This is a human game now and say, mm. hey, you might not think of yourself as an entrepreneur, but it might be time to replace your job with something entrepreneurial. And then we need to stop looking at those people and think they're ever going to be millionaires because they're not built like that, but mm. they are going to replace their jobs. Mm, that's such a great point. Like you don't have to be an entrepreneur, but you can engage in entrepreneurial activity yeah. versus like kind of putting your head in the sand and say, oh, it's going to be fine. Everything is going to work, work out, right? Yeah. <laughs> no. But I have a question for you. Yes. When that happens, so we're, this is more of a peer to peer moment. Yes. It's like I'm looking at, I've got, you know, our high end, our, our, you know, we've got high end. We've also got, you know, $50,000 packages and things like that. Yes. But I'm actually starting to look at some of the lower end, like high value, lower ticket, mm. um, which does require you to have traffic though. Like mm. that wouldn't be, I wouldn't recommend that to someone who doesn't have good money and haven't, hasn't figured out like Correct. cash flow Correct. because now you have to have a lot of traffic. Correct. Right? But Correct. it's like, I mean, what do you think about that? Cause I'm thinking like some lower ticket because I totally know. agree. I totally agree because the way that I see it, of course, like I'm known for to offering high ticket programs, right? That's what I teach. Mm -hmm. uh, however, like you said, when you are not just selling within North America or certain countries, right? The, the top five or 10, However, you look at the world, even I look at my reach, this example, Dan Lok Show, now it's listened in over 177 countries, right? Like this podcast. Yes. So when you think about like global that I have, like say my YouTube channel, 10% of my viewers from India, right? Like it, it, we have students from all over the world. And if you only focus on that market, like say, okay, I'm only serving the US or only serving Canada, I think that's a very narrow way of thinking. So they may not be ready for the $15,000, $20,000, $30,000 offer. However, if you have a lower ticket offer, but that's huge volume, right? Yeah. And, 
And to, to me, I think longer term. Like with, with me, I'm not thinking about adding value to just for this group of students for one year. I want to nurture students for like the next five, 10 years, right? Yeah. So maybe they're not ready for that today, but five years from now, they could be ready. And yeah. I want to be the one to get them from, like not maybe not from 100K to like a million. How about like from zero to 10K? Let's yeah. just get there first, right? And if, if I am the mentor that can help them go from zero to 10K and then from 10 to 20, then when they are ready to take that leap, then I'm there to serve them. So that's the way I see it. Yeah. Uh, and I think we, yeah, I totally agree. The lower ticket, it doesn't devalue what we offer because they're totally different things, right? Yeah. But there are ways that you could offer value at a lower ticket. So I totally agree. Yeah, that's cool. It's interesting. Thanks for answering that. Yeah. And so I want to talk to you about like, I love what you said, building the billion dollar company. So at eight figure going to the next level, uh, I know you, you like, you're very structured, right? Yeah. Well, how do you manage, how do you structure your company in a way that you could do that? that could apply to, or to all entrepreneurs, right? Because most of the time, you know, yeah. they, hit, they hit the glass ceiling and then they're stuck and they, they're the control freak or they can't let go. Like, yeah, you-, you got it. First of all, I mean, everybody knows you got to innovate, but there's, first of all, I, I really focus on growing my leadership more yeah, than yeah. trying to add new strategies to my business. Okay. Um, and I grew multiple millions by just selling three and a half months a year. And I have my own sales team. It yeah. used to be one person, then it was two people, then it was three people. And now it's grown mm-hmm. um, and continues to grow. Mm-hmm. And so my so the strategy again was selling one thing and selling it really well, and it still is. Mm-hmm. And but it's infrastructure in the team. So mm-hmm. we focus on leadership. My whole team has been through leadership trainings. Um, we actually bought a leadership training, brought it in house mm-hmm. uh, because at the end of the day, if you can't think smart, you can't get there. I mean, think about it. If you, if you know a formula works and you run so many people through it, why does a certain amount of people succeed and others don't? Well, they have a certain base level, base level of leadership. You even said control. When, my, when I exploded in real estate, um, not to like throw this interview in a different direction, but I went from being completely stuck, not being able to sell anything to $170 million in sales. And I was the only person who sold. And I had an assistant in my office. Mm-hmm. And what I did was I leveraged other uh, investor bases, databases, mm-hmm. but, but, and a whole nother story. But how did I explode to that? Well, I mean, I stopped controlling conversations. I mean, I, I literally would get on a phone call and I would cut people off because I thought I knew better and nothing was coming together. There's nothing worse than being ambitious and mm-hmm. feeling like the rug keeps getting pulled out from underneath you. But that's typically a sign of being too intense. There's a difference between intensity and driven. So actually the game is leadership and that's all I've focused on. Mm. So I went from three and a half months a year of selling and that's all I sold mm. and did a multiple seven figure company mm. and then moved it to now we sell every single month. But I don't just like, I don't, for me, it doesn't work for me to deliver products that don't have coaching for me, just mm. for me, because I don't feel like enough people go through them. And because I know that I didn't create my success in two years, I created it by staying on one thing for five to eight years. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, so I have to enroll my clients to just stay here. And so, which means that I've got to get them results. So I over deliver in coaching. So we, we have a whole coaching department right now and the coaching department. Now we're working on monetizing that department because it's an expense of the company. Yes. But all the way growing the company, I watched my profit margin. So I wasn't like, oh my God, that's the way to grow. I'm just going to risk, 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 risk. Mm. I literally was like, we have to stay at a 30 to 35% profit margin. Mm. And I still get paid. Mm. So that's been my measurement. And I've just, even when I didn't understand my P&Ls, I just mm. understood that profit margin. Mm. And yes. I focused on the step that I was in and the thing I could control. And if that profit margin went down, I went and sold more. And then I would, I would like look at where am I investing and make sure that I'm investing in lead gen or mm. on people. Yes. Yes. Let's see if I understand this correctly. I, I love it. Where, there's so many directions we could go. I love this. Yeah. I always say business is a game of margin, not, not volume, right? Yes. <laughs> Just, it, it's not, Hey, can some entrepreneurs think I'm not making a lot of profit. I, I'm sure I can make that up in volume. No, you cannot make that up in volume. Trust me on that. Right. Cause yeah. you grow, you have higher, more people, everything costs right. you money right as you grow your profits should be going like this 
No. Yeah, which normally most people it doesn't. They hit a million and it goes way down. It goes way down. So, so talk to us a little. So let, let's see if I understand that. So you are doing a lot of lead gen, right? You bring them in. You've got a great sales team, a lot of leadership, and they are selling the pace program, right? And from yep. there, you've got all the infrastructure. They get value. They attend the, the, the live event. And from there, there's the, if they want to continue the journey with you, that they could. So what, what I'm hearing is, number one, you're very focused on just one thing right? You're very focused on getting that dialed in, very good on lead gen just for this and very good at converting, right? And also delivering the program. That's right? the base. Nothing works yeah. without that. Yes. And then from there, now when you say that you went from selling it in a few, 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 few months a year to like once uh, every month, like talk to us a little bit about that. Like I just- So I used to, I delivered the product live through conference calls. Um, I'd sell for three months and in that three months that wave would go through for the year and I would yeah. teach them live until yeah. I had a group that we had a bunch of people go from startup to six figures, yes. right? And that is not an income claim. Yes. So, but we had a bunch of people pop and I was like, you know what, take all those recordings and put them in Kajabi, make, yes. them, make them a system for people to go through. And one of the challenges people had is when you had really ambitious people, they didn't want to wait to the next week mm -hmm. to get the next step. Yeah. And so they wanted to go and I'm like, sorry, like, this, this is the structure. So now they can unlock modules and go as quick as they want mm -hmm. and rock it out. But mm -hmm. then there's this, the, the problem you have to innovate is I know myself. I mean, I've bought info products and they are still not opened because mm -hmm. of the fact that it's hard to create time. Even if like, I probably have three Pinterest accounts or three Pinterest trainings because I know Pinterest is an, I think it's an untapped market for lead yes. gen. Yes. Also and, for the audience too, right? Yes. And yeah. so I finally hired somebody, but it took me forever to find a Pinterest team that actually knows what they're doing around traffic. Mm. And so I bought like three programs and it's like, I just can't, I, it is not my best use of time to figure out how to run a Pinterest account. Mm. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't make sense. It makes more sense for me to do, you know, nine, 10 events in a month. Yes. That yeah. makes way more sense to me learning yeah. how to do, to do so. So when I look at, when I look at just that, I'm driven mm. and I look at that, I'm like, they're never going to watch these modules. So, <laughs> so even though I can get them to buy and get them excited, yes. the amount of leadership it will take me as far as connecting with them and inundating them to keep them motivated is more than I want to give. Right. So I built a coaching team yes. that meets with them every 10 to 14 days and they have to watch at least two modules before they meet with their coach. Wow. And once a week, I meet with all the coaches on a Zoom call because we're all around the world mm -hmm. on a Zoom call. And I coach the coaches and I want to know what's going on with their people so I can coach the coaches. Mm -hmm. Now our next step is we're going to actually create a certification program for our PACE coaches. Mm -hmm. They don't have to pay for it. They get it for free, but mm -hmm. it actually even systemizes them even stronger to go mm -hmm. out there and just really make an impact. At the end of the day, our focus is really, truly, everything we think about in the company is how do we get more people successful? We don't, we don't obsess about how to grow because we, we compound because people stay with us. So mm -hmm. I don't have to do as much on the front end, even though we're mm -hmm. kind of unleashed in that area. Mm -hmm. We've figured out traffic now, but even before I figured out traffic, I don't have to do as much because we compound, because we do such a good job at helping people get their results. And I don't think entrepreneurs, many of them get that. They work really hard on one aspect and they forget that people really have to get the results and they get frustrated when people complain. It's like the client this morning was a PR company and she's like, God, now I'm so like, I've all, all these clients and they're all complaining because they feel confused. I'm like, stop, it's just feedback. Yes. It just means that like, I'm like, well, tell me, what did you give them? She told me, I'm like, Girl, like that one question, like what's their vision? Yes. I asked Jesse Itzler, a friend of mine, Sarah Blakely owns Spanx, her, her husband. I asked Jesse Itzler before he launched his endurance thing. I did the first two endurance programs with them, mm. right? Um, and we, we sold it to our community and he got really clear on what was, he was doing. Guy yeah. is so inspiring. But I asked him, well, what's your vision for this? When I was, you know, talking to him and he was brainstorming what to do next. Mm. And he's like, I mean, he didn't know what his vision was. He's like, all I know, like, he's like, he couldn't answer that question. What he could answer is what he loved, which was empowering people, living his life and his life resume. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, you know, to my client, I'm like, you just ask them a loaded question and you wonder yes. why they're confused because you gave them three other steps with that. 
<laughs> That's correct. I could see that. I could see that. And, and it, it, it's such a good point because if you think about where entrepreneurs, when they're stuck, that they, they lack the vision or they lack clarity, right? We, and always you lack clarity, you lack the ability to take action. Yeah. Right? And I love, I love how also hearing your, your, the way you structure your business, you structure your business around your lifestyle preference. 100%. Versus, versus, That's why I'm not on the speaking circuit. Yeah, right. And I think I, I made a mistake myself as well earlier on where I structure my life around my business, right? It's always the business like pulling me, okay, the business, business requires me to do this. It requires me to do this. It requires me to do a lot of different things. Yeah. And, but when I realized, no, 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 why am I even doing this, right? Like, it, it, what, what am I doing it for? It's it just for like ego, dollar amounts, I can compare or awards and all these things. What am I doing it for? If I'm doing it for other people, then I have to ask myself, do I enjoy the process, right? Because yeah. like you said, you could do so many events, but if you do too many events, then you get exhausted, then you don't like it, you get burned out. It's just that balance, well, right? I actually just found out that there's another guy doing my model in Australia. Yes. And he did 48 events in, uh, in February. <laughs> and he did 7 million in revenue in February. And I was like, I'm so competitive. I have to figure out how to do that. And, and so it's funny, but, but I still committed to the fact that I'm a mom. Yes. I have a live in nanny, but my live in nanny does not, uh, does not mother my child. Mm. I, I do homework with my four year old. He already has homework is speech therapy. After <laughs> school, I drive him to school. Nice. I get up, I start work at, you know, five 30 in the morning. You know, he, he's basically in my arms at like seven 30 as we're having breakfast together. I drive him to school. I go work out. I do my day, but I've already, I've already done my main thing that I, that I'm committed to for the day before he gets up, like whatever that is. And so the rest of the day is like cherry on a cake of what I create, but I'm done at two 45. I go pick him up, take him to swim class or soccer. And then I typically go for a walk and my phone goes in a box. I have a box for my phone because I am not as, as much as like people might say, Oh, you know, you're real structured. I am, but I, this thing is very addicting. Mm. And I was on the beach taking pictures of my son and I, and I real to post on Instagram and stuff. And I'm like going, I'm the only time I talked to my kid was when I was scolding him because I was afraid of him going in the water and hurting himself. Like that is not the bond I want. Like mm. I want him to remember me giving him heck. You know, and so I was like, ah, got to find another innovative strategy. Phone has to go in the box so that yeah. I can be present. Okay. So, but I'll share this one little piece that I think maybe help yes, other please. people too. Once you figure out your sales, once you figure out your traffic, a scaling game is finding partnerships that you can roll into companies and create mega companies. Boom. I love it. Talk to us about really that. I love that. So, I love that. We're rolling out a speakers division right now. Obviously, events and speaking is great. I do not want to go teach all of that as much as I can. Like, like I don't want the company to be circulated. I don't want hardcore business to be circulated around Shanda. Mm -hmm. I actually want other powerful people. So I'm actually rolling other successful companies into my company that fit my culture. That's a really important piece. Like mm -hmm. we have a very, we're people before profits. And you know my profit margins. Like mm. it's like, but we make our decisions, people before profits. We always do the right thing. Mm. And so when we're rolling companies in right now, we have two companies rolling in right now. Mm. I'm in company acquisition mode. And these oh, are I love it. Gurus. I love it. These are gurus and personalities that already have very successful companies. Mm. We're not only gonna weather the recession together. Mm. But we now have multiple offers inside the company that are not Shanda Sumter, which means that they're not expecting me to show up to those masterminds, which means that they're not expecting me to show up to Zoom trainings, info products, whatever. It means that the company can still scale. We can serve our clients based on what they've asked for. Yes, what they need, yes. I was, I was already referring out in these areas. Mm -hmm. and, and also, I don't take affiliate fees. We only refer to companies that we believe. Yes, we ask the other companies to give our clients a discount nobody else has. Mm -hmm. And I don't take referral fees. Mm. And so you see the people before profits piece. So if they fit our culture, we bring them in. And, um, and if it's something our clients want. And we are now, like I own the company, 
Mm. They own percentage profit margins in the divisions. Mm. And after a certain amount of years, and each of them are different, then mm. they, go, they, own, uh, they own a percentage you know, of that division mm. um, when they hit a certain like year. You mm. know what I mean? So it's yeah. income per year. And, yeah. and those, those divisions are separated as separate companies, but they're all under the umbrella of hardcore business. Does that make sense? I love it. I love it. And just so my audience knows, it's, it's not hardcore. It's E-A-R-T. H-E-R-T. Hardcore. hardcore right? Yeah. Heart center. Yeah. Sense. And love the way that you're doing it because I think it's super innovative. Now, I thought I'm the only one that, that does kind of that kind of thing. So I'm so excited here. That's your model because same thing. I'm acquiring different companies, uh, not so much in the personality space, but in the software, different space. Where That's I'm, I'm building this. So I am focusing on my personal brand. Yep. At the same time, I have all these businesses that would fit into that personal brand. Yeah, so that's very Tony Robbins style. Yeah, exactly. That's what Tony did, right? I mean, he's, he has his personal brand, but now he has a group of companies that's, that has nothing to do with personal development or the, the seminar business. It's, it's all like all over the board, right? That's why, I think people, uh, that's why I think people that are growing in entrepreneurship need to follow and need to follow like, first of all, there, there's so, like you and I are doing it different. Yes. Yet it's actually the same result. Yes. You know what I mean? And like, cause my vision is to always like, I love empowering people. Like that's just what gets me off. You know, I just, I love empowering people. Yes. And so that's why my vision looks like this. And we're going to the same place where we're leveraged and we're making a huge impact with our life mm. and our breath. And we're bringing on more people that could make a that's bigger right. impact. Yeah. That's right. But we're doing it based on what lights us up. Yes, that's exactly it. So then when we do still do the event and do that, it's, it's not just because, you know, there are speakers out there, they, they do events because they have to do events. Yeah. Um, and it, there's a difference. And it's like, I tell my team the same thing, that we are very, very good at, of course, marketing and, and branding and social media. Yeah. But really, like, I'm totally on the same page. I want to get to a point where we don't have to do that. Yeah. If that makes sense. It's not like we don't do it anymore, but I want to get to a point where our students, they're so successful that it creates this momentum that, oh yeah, you know what? If we bring in more, more, more people, more students, that's great. But just focusing on serving and adding value to our existing students, that alone is a huge thing, right? That's what I want to focus on. Well, actually, what you're actually saying is that everybody's looking outside the bucket where if you actually looked at what you, your resources you already have right. and spent time growing that, Correct. That's the game. And, and you see so many even uh, in the in, uh, entrepreneurs in the internet marketing space, right? Yeah. They're so good at, at marketing and, and bringing the leads and bringing people. But you, you, when you look at their product, the product sucks, right? The drop down rate is so high or the refund rate is so high. So they have to work harder, bring in more and more and more people. And as you and I know, the cost of bringing new it's people- It's expensive. It's expensive, right? But once you bring them in, you deliver, it's like, duh. You bring someone in, you deliver results. They love you. You love them. You guys stay like stay with you for a long, 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 long time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and so everybody knows that um, my first pace program that I launched, mm. uh, I was originally called Sapphire. <laughs> I'll never do jewelry again, mm. but it was originally called Sapphire, and mm. not one person got their result. And they they like and wow. like two people still renewed with me. And I'm like, I look back, I was like, how do I make this better? I really think it took me about three years to really make it better. And now it's on its ninth year. Mm. And the crazy thing is, is I think going in the scaling process of selling 12 months out of the year and adding these coaches, mm. I think it's the best it's ever been. Mm. And so it's like, you think about, I've been working on the same product for nine years. Mm. I mean, it's just an aha moment, like how something keeps getting better. If you, it's like a relationship, if you're intimate with it, you can still find ways to make it better mm. and, and instead of just make it good enough because it's like you said, Dan, if you focus on your client base, your customer base, once you have them and you can create raving fans and you can create the game is reoccurring income. So yeah. you can create reoccurring income. Yeah. That means that like every year that they're with you, the cost of acquisition goes way down for that, for that person or that customer. Yes. And that is the game of wealth. You are not, when I hear these things like, I just had a seven figure launch. I'm like, yeah. And you gave 70% of that away 
to do that. Yeah, and then, and and then you have a 5% refund and this yeah, and that. Yeah, and I'm like, matter. people don't get it. I'm like, you guys, that that is, a funnel is not a business, you know? And, and I think they also brag about the, the numbers, right? Oh, like, that's why I say, I tell people, don't be so impressed with people. Oh, I made X amount of dollars with a launch and a million dollars here and there. I said, he's who you should be impressed with. People who are building a business and they're successful for many, many years. Yeah. Like, don't, study, don't study the people, oh, they're successful in one year and the next year they're like gone. Yeah. Study people have wow. been around like 10, 15, 20 years and it's not a lot of this. It's more like this. Yeah. Oh, so you want to pay attention to, right? That's right. Oh, That's right. I'm going to give you real advice. Yes. I also want to talk to um, our audience a little bit about speaking because I know you're a phenomenal speaker, great presenter. You conduct events. Uh, for entrepreneurs, if they want to improve their speaking game, if they want to be more powerful presenter, what are one or, one or two like, big tips you've learned in your career? Yeah, hook really well. Um, but you hear that all the time. So when I say hook really well, just, just literally what's in it for them and start every conversation like that. Uh, mm -hmm. I, you can, I think great speakers sometimes get lazy. I practice all the time. Yeah. I practice my, if I'm making an offer, I have at least practiced the same offer at least 20 to 40 times. Like I wow. walk around, I put like wall size post-its up. I literally am going to create a whole brand of wall size post-its because I've grown this company on wall size post-its. <laughs> That's the secret. <laughs> wall size post-its. Keep it simple and keep it in front of you all the time. <laughs> and, um, and I just practice over and over and over again. So, uh, but I would say being authentic and enthusiastic is really important. Mm. And when you're speaking, yeah, when you're speaking, whatever you hook with, make sure you pull that through line through everything. Mm. So it's like a lot of people hook with something and then they give their steps of content and then either make an offer or maybe there's no offer at, at mm. whatever you're speaking. But right. they miss that they, they don't pull their point. They don't pull their through line all the way through. It's the same with when doing random, copy, uh, random content online. Mm. I'm not the biggest girl online or the biggest uh, person online. But, you know, based in our space, Dan, like definitely starting to rally as one of the top influencers. My husband always says, like, I run under the radar, you know, mm -hmm. like it's, it's because I'm not at every event. I'm at very few events. I'm not on the speaking gig. But when I do go speak or I do go work, I, I run 52 events this year and we just added 10 yesterday. Wow. So that's 62 events. I don't wow. leave all of those, but yes. we have a through line that goes through all of our events that no matter who's speaking and who's doing it, the through line, it's like we're driving the point all the time, the same point. And so people get it, they get it all and, they, and then they succeed because they know what the point is. And so I think a lot of speakers, they make it about them sounding good or they even start at the beginning with like, hey, it's so nice to see you, it's so nice to be with you. It's like, come on, just get to the point. Yes. Like hook right away. Yes. You hook right away on, you know, yes. it makes a huge difference. And I also believe that when I was, when I lack experience before I go on stage, I would be very kind of self-conscious about, oh, how do I look? How do I sound? Like it's, it's again, me, 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 me. Oh, right? right? And then that's when you focus on yourself, you get more nervous, right? Sweaty palms and, and like you get nervous. But then yeah, and I love your personality. I love that you're so giving and you get it. Right, like then, then I get on stage and now I just, like the other day I was presenting in front of my, like all my leaders, a hundred people, right? And my mic wasn't working, right? Yeah. So then I thought, oh, like, the, if the, 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 the old me before would be, oh my God, I don't, I don't, I, I'm in front of my, I'm embarrassing myself, right? I'm yeah. like, don't worry about it. I'm my on stage, get a little tape, tape it here and fix it on, like on stage in front of all my leaders. I'm like, it's okay. Like, I don't, I don't it's worry about it. Deal. It's not going to take away from my delivery or content. And as my, my team is fixing the mic, I'm still keep on talking. I'm doing my thing. Yeah. And that's the thing. I'm not focusing on what I look like, what I sound like, I care about. Are you walking away with value and, and steps what to do, right? Yeah. Do you know Dean Graziosi? Yes, of course. I'm actually talking with Dean, I think, next week. Oh, awesome. So Dean spoke at my last uh, Zone event and yeah. uh, last year. And mm. he, it was, we went out for dinner like a couple nights after the event. And when I went to go make my offer, talking about like bloopers, like speaking bloopers, I go to make <laughs> my offer and the 
the clicker's not there to put the offer up on the screen. Oh, wow. And so like I had to walk, there's something called like holding the tension when you go make an offer. So mm -hmm. I walked the audience, thousands of people, I walked the audience as pulling the tension back in until the clicker got back up there. And then I went through the offer. Then I went to go do the, the room drop and none of the team, this never happens. I mean, yeah. Never happens, but I changed the offer and I, I didn't role play it with them. So it left for breakdown and communication. Mm -hmm. And so nobody was there to drop the offer. They were all standing back. I'm like, all right, guys, can you hand out the offer? Like, it was <laughs> like there was nothing I could do. And, and so the offer went fine. It didn't go great. But the next day, and this is a great tip for speaking, I didn't miss the, like, it wasn't a strategy. I didn't miss the opportunity to tell them and teach them everything that went wrong the day before and oh. literally how some of you guys jumped up and you took the offer and I, I'm welcoming you to pace. But the truth is, is some of you guys had a sleepless night last night because you know you should have done it and you didn't or you were afraid to do it because you got, you know, someone at home or you're in debt and you needed me to be great to be able to climb your walls. And I was like, so now I'm going to be great. And I launched into a repitch and then brought everybody to the back of the room. We had 40% of the room say yes. I wow. think they just appreciated me being real. Wow. And when I went out for dinner with Dean, Dean's like, holy shit. Like 40% like of a room saying yes to a $15,000 offer who doesn't know me, you know, is incredible. And so it's like, that was not the perfect talk, mm. but it was honest. Yeah. And I knew where I was going and what the through line was to drive them to the back. Yes. I think what we're saying is as a speaker, as a presenter, we also need to be able to adapt and use what's in the room that we're okay to, to deviate a little bit from just our agenda or our, our pitch, right? You can say, hey, you can use it. I mean, no, no one does it and no one without confidence could, could pull that off. It's because you've been doing it for so many years and you've been through a lot and you feel deep down. And it's not that, about me. Right? Yeah. It's not about me. Yeah. I like, it's not about me. I, I love it. We, I, we could talk all days. This is so, so, so awesome. Uh, and I love, love what you're doing. And, and, and I can't believe we, we think so much alike. I yeah. Mean, uh, definitely, definitely want to um, connect more as well. For our audience, if they want to find out more about Pace, about more what you do, what's the best way to do that? Uh, well, they could always go to our Hardcore Business website, but I would say follow us on uh, Facebook, on our Hardcore Business page. Um, okay. Don't go to my Shanda Sumter Facebook yes. page. You'll get lost. Go to our Hardcore Business. I'm on there Monday through Friday doing a Coffee with Shanda show at 7 a.m. Pacific. Oh, I love it. I love it. Yeah, it's love good. Shanda. It's love a it. good way it. to start your morning. Come out. And coffee. I'll make sure I'll put a link here and also for my podcast and the show notes as well. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for being with us. I'd love to have you back. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate you. I appreciate your advice. And I'm sure my audience feels the same way. Uh, you're awesome, Dan. Thank you.